Now we're going to take a look at a few methods for the synthesis of ethers. We'll look at a few reactions in detail and I'll also mention a few other related reactions that you've seen before in your Organic One course. So the first reactions we're going to look at involve strongly basic reaction conditions and an alkali metal alkoxide salt. And so looking for example at this NaOCH3, it's really Na plus the sodium cation and OCH3 minus the alkoxide or in this case specifically the methoxide anion. And it's the methoxide anion in this process that's going to serve as the nucleophile. The electrophile is an alkyl halide that's suitably substituted for SN2, in other words, a primary alkyl halide. Provided we have that primary electrophile in the presence of an alkoxide like methoxide, an SN2 process can take place, bimolecular nucleophilic substitution in which the formation of the CO bond and cleavage of the carbon leaving group bond, here the leaving group is bromide, occurs simultaneously. The electrons in the new carbon oxygen bond come from the nucleophilic oxygen and the byproduct of this reaction is bromide anion. You'll often see the reaction conditions written this way with the alkoxide salt and the alcohol both over the arrow. More commonly these conditions are generated in situ or in the reaction flask by treatment of the alcohol, in this case it would be methanol, with the alkali metal itself, which in this case would be sodium. And what happens here is a process involving reduction of the alcohol and the production of H2 gas, which bubbles out of the reaction mixture. In the second example, which is another example of this anionic SN2 synthesis of ethers, you see those reaction conditions written directly above the arrow, and you'll see both of these in examples. This method involving the synthesis of ethers through an anionic SN2 reaction is referred to as the Williamson ether synthesis. And for reasons we'll explore in a second, the Williamson ether synthesis is limited to the synthesis of ethers involving at least one primary alkyl group so that the SN2 process can work. However, a related reaction can be used to synthesize aryl ethers from nucleophilic oxygen, anionic oxygen, and alkoxides. And this related reaction involves nucleophilic aromatic substitution of electron-poor aromatics like nitrobenzenes and electron-poor heterocycles. This process doesn't occur through an SN2 mechanism. It involves addition elimination. However, it still involves the displacement of a good leaving group or nucleofuge by an alkoxide anion, and so I wanted to mention it here as an analog of the Williamson ether synthesis. Now, the Williamson only works when the new bond formed involves a primary carbon. If the electrophilic carbon is secondary or tertiary, in other words, if it's more sterically hindered than a primary carbon, this reaction will not work. And we can understand the reason why if we think about the competing reaction that occurs when the electrophile is hindered. Think back to your Organic One course. What competing reaction occurs for a hindered electrophile, let's say tert butyl bromide, in the presence of a strong base, and base is a good hint, like sodium methoxide? Well, what we want to happen is SN2 substitution of bromide by the methoxide anion. However, the hydrogens that are beta, we might say, to the electrophilic carbon or beta to the bromine are much more sterically accessible than the electrophilic carbon. And so rather than substitution, we'll observe elimination and more specifically E2 elimination under these strongly basic conditions. And so, in fact, we won't end up with an ether at all. We'll end up with an alkene as well as the neutral alcohol and bromide anion. So watch out for this. The electrophile must be primary for the Williamson ether synthesis to work. And when you're working backwards from an ether that you want to make back to the starting materials, make sure to disconnect in the reverse direction these bonds between primary carbons and the ether oxygen. Avoid disconnecting for example, a bond to a secondary or a tertiary carbon when thinking about the Williamson ether synthesis. We can't touch that bond using a Williamson. We can also synthesize ethers from alcohols using strongly acidic reaction conditions using a cationic SN2 process. And here the idea is that the combination of the strong acid, which is going to generate H3O+, essentially quantitatively, and the alcohol, leads to the formation of a protonated alcohol through a PT, or proton transfer elementary step. We now have an intermediate that's kind of analogous to the alkyl bromide that we saw in the Williamson ether synthesis, in that we have a primary electrophilic carbon linked to something that is a good leaving group, the OH2 plus group. 
We also have in the reaction mixture a decent nucleophile, the neutral alcohol, still hanging around. When the nucleophilic lone pair engages with that electrophilic carbon, we observe an SN2 elementary step occurring through electron flow like this. And the result now is a protonated ether. This step has generated water, and so we'll draw water as kind of falling out of the mechanism here. And of course, the only thing required to complete the mechanism is just deprotonation of this protonated ether. Now the slide lists a couple of conditions on this process that we can understand if we look at the mechanism in detail. The first is that only primary alcohols work. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward considering the SN2 step that occurs right here. This carbon needs to be primary in order to avoid problems with elimination, for example. The second limitation of the reaction is that only symmetrical ethers can be prepared this way. If we try to use two different alcohols in this process, then we'll run into problems if the first proton transfer step is uncontrolled because the two alcohols are likely to be similar in basicity and so using two different alcohols will lead to a mixture of for example the A alkyl group with the A alkyl group this ether the A alkyl group with the B alkyl group or the B alkyl group with the B alkyl group and with an uncontrolled PT step we'll get basically a statistical mixture of these three things and so we'll get a messy mixture of three different ethers and in theory anyway a maximum of 33 percent yield of the ether we want say we want the AB ether we'll only expect that 33 percent yield and these three will be very difficult to separate and so only symmetrical ethers where we use one alcohol to create both sides of the resulting product, both alkyl groups and the resulting product can be made. It's also worth mentioning here that we can think about synthesizing ethers through an SN1 approach, and this works well for highly substituted ethers that can't be made through SN2, and perhaps that include aryl groups, for instance. Neither of these CO bonds can be made through an SN2 process, be it cationic or anionic. The problem with the left-hand bond is that the would-be electrophilic carbon is too substituted, right? That's a tertiary carbon, that's a problem. And the problem with the right-hand CO bond is that the carbon group is aromatic, it's a benzene ring, and so trying to craft this bond through an SN2 reaction of like an aryl bromide will not work either. However, this is a nice target for an SN1 process, particularly if we focus on this bond on the left between the tert butyl group and the oxygen. We can make this ether by starting with a tert butyl electrophile. Just to mix it up, let's make it a tosylate, OTS. Tosylate is paratoluene sulfonate. That's a good leaving group. And we can achieve the formation of this ether just by treatment with phenol. Phenol's already got one of the ether CO bonds built in. And as you've seen, this is typical of ether synthesis methods. One of the CO bonds already exists. And now the synthesis of this ether involves an SN1 process in which the first step is loss of the tosylate leaving group. The second step is association of the nucleophilic alcohol to the carbocation that's generated in the first step. And then the third step is just proton transfer and that generates the neutral ether at the end. This general mechanism makes it clear that the SN1 approach is sort of complementary to the SN2 approach because hindered ethers, hindered alkyl ethers can be made using SN1, while unhindered alkyl ethers can be made using the SN2 approach. So far we've looked at substitution-based methods for synthesizing ethers, but additions can be used as well, and these take advantage of the nucleophilic nature of the alcohol oxygen. So acid-catalyzed additions to alkenes, for example, are analogous to the acid-catalyzed hydration reaction, which you may have seen before. The first step is protonation of the alkene, and this occurs with Markovnikov site selectivity. This just means that the more substituted and more stable carbocation is generated in this process. And now, in essence, we've reached a point where we're at the same point we were at at the SN1 synthesis we just looked at. We have the neutral alcohol, here it's benzyl alcohol, in the presence of a carbocation. And so the neutral alcohol can coordinate to in an A sub N step the carbocation and the resulting structure is a protonated ether. Deprotonation of this protonated ether either during workup or in the reaction conditions generates the product. And if we focus now on the structural changes that have occurred, notice that a hydrogen atom has been added to the less substituted carbon. It's an implicit hydrogen on this methyl group now that was a CH2 in the starting material. And if we focus on the CO bond that's created, 
notice that this carbon is very highly substituted. And that was important because if we look at the carbocation, we see that this carbon bearing the positive charge is the one that ends up in the new CO bond in the product. So this needs to be either a highly substituted carbon or one that can support positive charge well. When we get to reactions of carbonyl compounds in a future video series, we're going to see reactions that are highly analogous to this acid catalyzed addition process. And the one that's worth mentioning here is hemiacetal formation, which is essentially this mechanism using a CO double bond rather than a CC double bond. So we will see this kind of reactivity again.